Hey everybody, Hoosier Jedi here with another review for you. This time I'm talking episode 6 of The Flash called The Flash is Born. And in general, I think this was a pretty strong episode. We get to see a lot of little nice moments for just about all of our major characters. Uh, there's some big stuff with the overall major mystery of the, of the season. And even a couple of nice little nods to the comics. So let's just kind of get right into things. Uh, I want to talk about those uh, nods to the comics before I forget any of them. There were only <clears throat> a couple of them this time around. Uh, the first one was that comes to mind is, um, and this is one of the harder ones to spot, is if you um, look at the background when uh, Barry and Eddie go to investigate things at the steel yard, uh, the, steel, the old steel mill, you see a sign in the background that says Garrick's Wharf. Uh, this is a nod to Jay Garrick who was the original Flash in the comic books. He was created back in uh, the 1940s, if I remember correctly. And in the more modern continuity, he was basically the person who used the name, uh, the, the first person to call him themselves the Flash. Although um, I could be wrong about that, given the things involving New 52. Uh, but um, that's just sort of the way I remember it from the comics when I was um, reading DC. Uh, sadly, I don't really read anything DC these days. It's just too darn confusing. Although I will admit that uh, some of the collections that I have read recently, like um, the Wonder Woman books and Superman and Wonder Woman, they, ha they have their own book that's just all about them. Uh, those are quite good. Uh, so yeah, Wonder Woman and Superman and Wonder Woman, very re well recommended. Uh, <clears throat> uh, speaking of um, Superman, of course, we have Harrison Wells tossing around the words, the man of steel. Of course, Harrison Wells has knowledge of the future and, well, let's face it, uh, you know, Superman is something that's pretty hard to miss. So even though it's not explicitly stated, we can assume that somewhere out there in the Arrow and Flash universe, uh, young Clark Kent is um, probably in college or something. Uh, he, has, he had a time in his life where he was a little like Batman that he... Uh, sort of bounced around the world in his younger days before he uh, landed the job at the Daily Planet. Um, I remember even reading a story where he spent some time as a correspondent in Paris, a freelancer in Paris. Uh, <clears throat> so that was very cool. Uh, we also hear it mentioned that uh, there's a guy out there who's on fire but you know, doesn't die or b get burned or anything like that. This is almost certainly a nod to Firestorm, who is a character that's going to be appearing on the show later this season. And we also get to see Barry and Eddie visit Central City, which is, I'm sorry, Keystone City, and which is basically the, bri the city across the river from Central City, where Barry and all of them live. And I've mentioned Keystone City uh, before in these reviews, and the way it works in the comics is that Central City and Keystone City are basically two major cities right next to each other. Think, think Minneapolis, St. Paul. They're divided by a river. It's never explicitly stated what river it is, but in the comics they have said that Keystone City is in Kansas and that Central City is in Missouri. But, it, but whether or not this is still in continuity or if it even applies to the Arrow and Flash universe, which is of course its own beast, uh, that, that isn't clear. But the idea was kind of always that when he was the Flash, Barry lived in central and fought crime in Central City, and then when Wally West took over and became the Flash, he lived in Keystone City. Uh, interestingly enough, they have confirmed that Wally West is a character that they will bring onto the show eventually. Uh, just uh, doesn't look like that's going to happen anytime soon. Probably a season or two down the line, assuming uh, the show gets renewed. But from what I've heard about the ratings on Flash, uh, I don't think a season two is something that we really need to be overly concerned about not happening. Uh, so anyway, let's just kind of get right into what's going on with the characters this time around. And interestingly, uh, it's Iris who does the opening and closing narration for this episode. And that's very fitting because this is an episode that really focuses quite a bit on Iris, really starts to flesh her out, and we finally get some genuine time to spend with Eddie and get to know him. Now these, now we've all had a good bit with Iris so far. She well, even had that really great scene last episode where you find out that, you know, she's doing all this blogging and stuff for Barry to help and support him. But we've never really brought her into super close focus. And this episode does a pretty nice job of that. 
here during the course of this episode, we get to see that Iris is brave, she's resourceful, and she can take care of herself, you know, thanks to the training that she got from her dad as a kid. The only problem, of course, is that she is simply a completely and utterly outclassed in, in dealing with a metahuman. I mean, until, um, you know, Tony did that thing with his arm at, at the coffee shop, she had no idea that there was anybody else in the world with powers besides uh, besides the the streak. So, you know, it, it is pretty understandable that, uh, you know, Iris is um, not actually able to go full on action girl here, but she does acquit herself pretty reasonably well, and even is the one that finally lays out the, lays the punch um, on Woodward that puts him down for the count. So, I, I do like that they took the time to say show that yeah Iris can Iris can hold her own under most circumstances, and even in pretty crazy circumstances like being menaced by a, someone with superpowers, she'll keep her head and uh, you know do and do a reasonably good job of taking care of herself. And <clears throat> we also kind of get to see a little bit more about why Iris continues to do this beyond helping Barry. She sees that this seems to really be giving people hope. And I think that kind of gets through to Barry uh, quite a bit. And I think that's important because it is established in the comics that Barry is somebody who does inspire a lot of hope. Um, basically, in a long story short, there was this famous story in Green Lantern where Barry was temporarily made a member of the Blue Lantern Corps. And their their whole thing is they focus on hope. That's what they're all about, is hope. And if he hadn't been able to be the sort of person that could inspire hope in other people, then Barry wouldn't have been able to um, gain the powers of the Blue Lanterns, even if it was temporary. And that is kind of goes back to one of the major things about the character of Barry Allen, is that he is universally respected among the superheroes of, of the DC Universe, particularly his friends in the Justice League, as one of the most moral of them all. That Barry is just flat out, flat out a straight-up good, honest, decent person. And the other heroes respect him tremendously for that. And now, of course, the thing is true for guys like Superman. Like, Clark Kent and Barry Allen are very, guys who, are, in a lot of ways, are very similar. But when you put them next to characters like Batman, who, while a good person, is also an extremely damaged guy, and he's also a guy who relies on fear to get what he does, does get the job done. His Batman's job is that he kind of goes out and he scares criminals. And Hal Jordan is a brave and good guy, but he's also a guy with an enormous ego, and um, you know, not the not the most responsible guy in the world. And you know, even Wonder Woman great as she is, sometimes lets that warrior temper get the better of her. So, um, again, the idea that of Barry just simply being a good and moral person who inspires hope in others is very critical to his character. And I like that the show is really doing a good job of presenting that in a way that isn't too, isn't, doesn't lay it on too thick. Uh, let's see. Um... Yeah, I can't really think about uh, too much else to say about Iris this episode. So let's go and talk about Eddie. Well, again, this is the first time we really get to see Eddie brought into focus. And I really like that they did that by having him spend some time with Barry. Now, it's a little, kind of a little wonder, bit of a wonder why Eddie is so hip to um, hang out with Barry this episode. I mean, granted, Barry's a very good crime scene tech and he's trying to solve a case. But I think more than a little bit of it is, uh, I should try and get along with my brother, my girlfriend's brother. And I haven't really, I don't really know this guy that well, so you know, let's let's um, let's ha let's let's get some guy time in. So in this episode, we do see them working together. Uh, Barry does help Eddie out at the steel mill, earns a little respect there, and then Eddie <laughs> takes him off to you know go blow off some steam with boxing, and even gives him some advice, which um ends up actually being pretty good advice. It, it is helpful. We do see these guys sort of becoming a little, bonding a little bit. And of course, this just sort of deepens the mystery of whether or not Eddie is um, reverse Flash or not. I, I don't really have an opinion about that one way or the other at the moment. But 
looking at it this way, it does really seem very strange that the idea that Eddie could be Reverse Flash. I mean, everything that we've seen presented about this guy really shows that he's nothing but a nice guy. Now, granted, they can be doing something here like uh, what we, they did with Ward over on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., and it turns out that this is all just an act. Or it could be something else entirely. But uh, in any case, they do need to focus on Eddie more, but here they took a really big step into sort of making him a more fleshed out and realized character. Uh, I also liked how we get a little bit of backstory from him that, you know, said that as a kid, Eddie was you know, fat and kind of unathletic. And they even mentioned that he was the son of a politician who closed down a local factory. And this uh, led to the, the kids at his school taking that out on him. So, again, you know, a nice touch there. We do, I think, need some more details. Like, like, what does he do outside of his job? And, you know, what people does he have in his life besides Iris and the people at the station? But, you know, one step at a time. We are only six episodes in, after all. Uh, nothing particular to say about Caitlin or uh, Cisco this this time around. Although it was uh, fun to hear them sit around and complain about uh, having been bullied as a kid. And uh, who was it? I think it was Barry that said, like, yeah, yeah, okay, I get it. We're all mega nerds here. I, I, again, just sort of uh, showing that... You know, Cisco and Caitlin are probably the kind of people that Barry would have been friends with, even if he hadn't gotten powers, had he just had the right circumstances in order to meet them. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's let's save let's save Woodward for a bit, and right now let's talk about Joe and uh, Harrison Wells. Now we've seen these two guys interacting a little bit, but the idea of Joe coming to Harrison for help in tracking down the reverse flash and let's just keep calling him that because that's who it is now that's interesting because well we know that Harrison Wells is up to something that he's not above murder and you know he is basically one of the big candidates besides Eddie for being the person behind who who is really reverse flash and of course we see this all pay off at the end of things with a uh, reverse flash showing up scaring the hell out of Joe, threatening Iris, and stealing all of Joe's evidence in uh, Nora, Al Nora Allen's murder. So, but anyway, getting back to Harrison and Joe, it really was interesting to see these sort of guys bounce off each other, because you were, basically you have Barry's former, basically Barry's father figure and former mentor, and Barry's kind of new mentor, who's also a bit of a father figure to him. He's someone that, uh, you know, Barry does obviously admire a great deal, especially given the way Barry geeked out over him in um, the first episode. But uh, we, again, we do see these guys working together, but then we also sort of see that little clash where Joe is, starts uh, you know, asking Wells some uncomfortable questions about his past. And not unreasonably, Wells gets pretty resentful about all of this. And then there's some stuff pops up that sort of hints at his dead wife and all this other things. And they do end up mending fences in the end, but you just have to watch that and wonder, like, how much of this is an act? How much of this is true? Wow, Harrison Wells shows up in uh, Central City only a month after Barry's mother died. I mean, it's just, hmm, what is going on with this guy? What is his deal, really? And I like how this really adds to the mystery. It gives us some new information but still leaves us scratching our heads. I mean, that that's good stuff. We've been given clues, we've been given some more details, but just what exactly is going on with Harrison Wells is still a legitimate and tough mystery, and that's, to me, good stuff. Let's see, what else, what else, what else? Um, okay, so I guess we might as well talk about Woodward. Uh, now, as people have probably picked up, especially even... Uh, let me try that again. Uh, now, the, uh, okay, deep breath, try again. So this time around, the bad guy is the fellow from the comics who goes by the name Girder. And that's not a name that uh, Cisco slaps on him. That's actually the name of the training dummy, which I thought, again, was a nice touch. Uh, but anyway, in, in the comics, Girder's origin is slightly different. Uh, here on the show, uh, Tony had gotten thrown, fell into the vat, when some guys pulled him off from uh, beating up the guy who had given him a pink slip. In the comics, it was actually a somewhat darker situation where he tried to rape a female employee at the steel mill. Uh, she fought back, and that's, that's how he got knocked into the vat of metal. 
So I think the way that Tony was just sort of creeping on Iris was perhaps a little bit of a nod to that. But if you're going to have an episode that's going to focus in seriously on one of the two major female characters on the sh- on a show, you don't want to be have that first episode where she's really the major focus focus of things be about her trying to fight off a guy who wants to rape her. I mean, no. No. That That is so not the way to go. I don't even know where to begin. And I'm glad the show didn't do that. But they did pick up that, yeah, Tony is a creep on a lot of levels and is um, really, really bad news. Uh, but beyond that, though, it does kind of sum up, get summed up at the end with Barry when he talks to him. And I love how Barry is just like, Man, screw secret identity. I'm going to go over there and I'm going to gloat in the face of the guy who used to beat me up when I was a kid. And of course, you know, taking somebody who was either a friend or even an enemy in childhood and turning them into a villain in is kind of a very classic uh, thing to do from the comics. Uh, like Tommy, Tommy Elliot from uh, Batman, uh, who appeared even on Gotham uh, just the other week, became the villain Hush. Uh no less than two other people that uh, P- Peter Parker went to high school with uh, also ended up becoming uh, superheroes. And that's, of course, Jessica Jones and Cindy Moon. Uh, Jessica Jones went by a couple of different names. Cindy Moon, uh, she, to be in all fairness, is a very new character to the comics. Uh, she, uh, through complicated reasons, beca- gained, also gained spider-like powers and became Silk. Uh, Flash Thompson, who was sort of the Tony Woodward of Peter's uh, childhood, uh, actually ended up becoming Peter's friend in later years, and these days he's uh, Agent Venom. Uh, And there are are numerous, numerous other examples. Uh, Kenny Braverman from the Superman comics, I think, is a much more straight example. But anyway, getting back to things. Um, It it was just really fun that Barry just went in there just for, for no other reason than to gloat. But basically, I like that point where Barry says, you know, you were given this gift and you used it for to hurt people for selfish reasons. And I was given this gift and I and I'm trying to go out there and do good with it. And that's why I'm the better man. Of course, now we have the problem that, yes, there is a villain who unquestionably knows that Barry Allen is the Flash. And if he ever gets out of that uh, prison in Star Labs, Barry's in a lot of trouble. But, yeah. Of course, this could also just be them sowing the seeds of a future thing. Where Barry has to learn, I guess I should be a little bit more protective of my secret identity. But, eh, you know, whatever. Uh, Let's see. Now, there was one other thing that I wanted to talk about, and I really liked it how is that when Barry is gearing up for that big rush towards Girder towards the end, you very briefly see a bit of lightning dance around his eye. This is, again, indicating that as time goes by, Barry is just going to keep getting faster and faster. His connection to the speed force, the source of power for the other speedsters in the DC universe, is growing and becoming stronger. He's, he's kind of like a Jedi to, uh, strengthening his connection to the Force. And, you know, this kind of brings up the question is, well, does is Harrison Wells' uh, thing going bluey the total reason why there are people with superpowers running around? Or as Joe even questions before, well, is it possible that there were people who had powers before all of this happened? Well, the answer in the comics is, yeah, there have always been su- people with superhuman powers in the DC universe. That's just kind of how things worked. Uh, like, going back as far as the caveman days, when uh, Vandal Savage gained immortality. Um, and if you're just looking at people with super speed, well, before Barry, there were guys like uh, Max Mercury, who's chronologically, I believe, the first person that we know of who had super speed. Uh, Other people like Johnny Quick and Jay Garrick, the original Flash, who were speedsters who fought during the Second World War. And if I remember correctly, uh, Turbine, who was a villain, uh, he also gained his powers during World War II. And then uh, Savitar, uh, it was never really made clear exactly when he gained his powers, but I think it was heavily implied that it was back during the Cold War days. So in the comics, there's a very long lineage of people having super speed before Barry Allen came along. But again, this does sort of raise the question, but here on the show, we sort of take the the particle accelerator explosion as like the moment when 
non-Mirakuru superpowers entered the world. But of course we also know that there was Reverse Flash running around back in the year 2000. And if you pay attention to this episode, you can even see a sort of a date timestamp on the interview with Barry as a kid that makes it clear that it is indeed the year 2000 that that happened. So, hmm, you know, could uh, that explosion have actually sort of messed around with space-time continuum, maybe sent some crazy energy out through different periods of history? The past? The future? Hmm, could be, could be. Anyway, guys, I guess we'll just have to stay tuned in order to find out. But, again, wrapping things up, another very good episode of the show. This show has really found its groove, and just uh, now that they've got enough episodes under its, their belt that they can start paying some things off, the show is just getting better and better. And it's not going to be that much longer until we get to see that really cool crossover with Arrow. Oh, yeah, and I almost forgot. This episode, uh, Barry is officially dubbed The Flash. And I like how when he's having that conversation with Iris, he sort of slyly nudges her towards calling him the Flash. Um, that all that conversation he had with Oliver back in episode one, obviously still fresh in his mind. So a nice touch there. Anyway, guys, that's all I have for you this time. As always, please comment, rate, and subscribe. And of course, you can follow me on Twitter at Who's Your Jedi. Until next time, take care and have a good one.